Good morning and welcome to WTJX live coverage of the swearing in of the 33rd Legislature of the Virgin Islands. My name is John Abramson Jr. and joining me today is Senator Gene Ford. Hey, good morning, John. A pleasure being here this morning doing this uh, coverage with you on WTJX. I think that the weather is wonderful for an auspicious occasion such as this and the garden, the Emancipation Garden where we are located today here is filling in nicely. Great job. But before we go there, let me take this first opportunity to offer my condolences on the passing of your mother. I, I know that feeling. Uh, my mother passed in 2 8. So take time to grieve and, and do it well. Well, I saw How are you otherwise? I thank you uh, uh, for your condolences and of course my family and I, it's been a big loss. Uh, my, my mother is one of the most meaningful individuals of course in my life and uh, she has been most supportive of me and I'm certainly, I'm very proud of her. And so I want to thank you very much for her. It's, she's going to be very missed by the family. But otherwise than that, I mean things are good, we are getting through. Uh, you know, and looking forward for this upcoming 2019. And, and it's going to be interesting because <clears throat> it's kind of we're making, a, um, in my, we're making a generational change from what I've seen so far in terms of, it looks like the millennials, the, the younger people have, have seized uh, both government house and the legislature. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, enthused at, at what I see so far. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I do think that um, we have a lot of hope to look forward for, and like you said, I, I'm looking forward to 2019 myself. Well, I think it's all positive, John. I mean, of course, you've got to realize that times are changing. The use of technology, the approaches that we use and so forth, I think that it's changing. And I'm gl certainly glad to see so many young individuals are taking part in, in, in what's going on, in the issues facing our community. I believe that our, our issues are not the senator's problems, are not the administration problems. Our issues are community problems. And so I believe that when, when the elderly, when the young, when everybody partake and participate in, in, in uh, trying to come up with a possible solution, I think that's most healthy. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because the other day I was on a talk show, a, a radio show, and one of the issues I kept raising was it is incumbent upon each individual to make a contribution. A lot of times we elect senators, and as soon as they're elected, we, once they're elected, we let them go. What we're supposed to do is bring them ideas, bring them suggestions, bring them issues that we want them to pursue. Um, again, we're one of the only places in the world where the senator during the campaign drives the campaign issue versus the electorate driving the campaign issue. But since they have been elected, I'm urging our community to get out there, assist the senators, work as hard as you can with them so that we can, because if everybody just do a little bit of something, I think we could come up with great ideas for a lot of the problems that, exist, that we are facing right now. You know, interesting that because often on um, my campaign trail, I have always said that again, don't just leave me out there hanging once I have been elected. I want to hear from you. And surprisingly, John, you really don't hear much from individuals once you are elected. You, 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 always, you always hear, once the decision has been made, that's when you hear from them. And you're gonna hear that it's the wrong decision. You should have said, you should have done. What we need is, you know, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, at the, at the debating process, the time when we were discussing this at length, you know, um, why didn't you bring these ideas out? I, I, I don't think, I think some people hold pe uh, senators on a very high pedestal, but at the same time, I think that they have to realize that we don't have all the answers. Um, you know, they need some guidance. Well, and believe it or not, the answers lie with the people. Well, Gene, I have to, one thing I have to say here, a lot of times, and I'm going to defend the electorate on this one, a lot of times the senators act like they get divine intervention once they get elected, that yes. they know everything about everything about everything. And that's not the case. We know that. Um, if you're fortunate to surround yourself with the good staff that are, that's proficient and efficient and know what they're doing, but we do have this perception that once you get elected, you know about insurance and yep, yep, education yep. and drag racing and horse racing and but it really isn't the case no, so I, I do want to emphasize that again <clears throat> you are right we need to have the people's involvement it's just not at the ballot box 
we do need them to come out because as you said once you make a decision it's too late the issue is to make decisions when it's happening i did want to m m mention that remember to remind everyone that we are streaming live on our facebook page and at our website at wtjx.org um, so if you need to tune in those are two avenues that you can see we have a number of people pouring into Emancipation Garden now. Um, looks like we're going to have quite a ceremony today. Uh, looking at some of the faces, they look familiar. Former Senator Rocky Leibert, a uh, two-term pre Senate pres two-time Senate president. A number of other individuals have started to stream in, so I think we're going to have a pretty interesting day. Of course, many individuals looking at the uh, monitors, the television today, may not recognize that we are, in fact, in the Emancipation Garden. It has taken on quite a transformation, actually. I see uh, former Senator uh, Usi Richards. Uh, Richards. My, 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 uh, my colleague and uh, um, uh, supervisor, supervisor Fox. Supervisor elections, Caroline Fox. Fox, yeah. my, my colleague. And I think and I just glimpsed. successor. I just glimpsed former Senator um, Cricky as well, Maynard, Cricky, Cricky Maynard. Cricky Maynard, well, so we've got her. Uh, from St. John's, we just we lost her. We have Ms. Uh, Jennifer Matarangas from, uh, from Bayer, Bayer. Uh, um, Chief of Government Operations. So, like I said, looks like it's going to be an extremely interesting day. So, oh, Gene, yeah. what do you think? Um, I want you to go back to your first experience when you first were elected to office and the first time that you had to make that uh, ceremonial walk to the bandstand and assume your seat and what, what's kind of going through the, your what's going through the newly elected you know we have we have how many new elected senators nine we have three over here five eight and one so at eight, last eight, nine so total nine, nine. nine. total, total nine, nine, nine yeah. yeah well i i can tell you that they're filled with pride um it, it's unbelievable of course the day you know that you you, you have won an election that's the night of the election, but you're really tired. You're excited, yes, people congratulating you, yes, but you're really tired and you're, you're really, it really doesn't sink in the way it's supposed to. But when you're making that walk, coming down on the red carpet, um, and you realize that this is now an official atmosphere that is going to be bestowed upon you now, this honor, this confidence coming from the people, it's tremendous. It's, it's, it, it's, it's is really it, is a sense of overwhelming. It, it, it's, it's overwhelming. It's and, overwhelming. And it's funny because you know, like uh, myself, I've, I've had public office, both being to elected to the board of uh, education and as supervisor of election. But I, I think in this kind of ceremonious activity, it's it's magnanimous how how as you said how prideful you feel just looking out at the crowd, knowing that those in the, that a number of those individuals sitting out there have have selected you out of all the other people that were potentially capable to be selected yeah to be their representative in the our republic democratic form of government and, and carry their carry the ball for them uh, of course and and of course you know no matter what position that you have held before um, in life it, it certainly does not compare in my opinion to this type of occasion Again, because this is where you are going to, from this moment onward, once you're sworn in, you are going to be making decisions that affect people's lives. People in mass. And I don't think that any other position, you know, except, of course, besides the administration position that does that. Well, I wanted to move quickly. Let's, let's talk a little about some of this, the upcoming senators. Um, alphabetically, we have uh, Senator Alicia V. Barnes. Um, Give me an idea. Who, who is Alicia? What, what can we look forward to for her? Well, I think uh, um, uh, uh, Ms. Barnes, Senator-elect Barnes, of course, um, she is uh, uh, a product of the USVI public education system. And I think that that's important to recognize that, again, that she has been here. She graduated in 1984 from the Central High School. She is a career professional here. Uh, she worked as director of the Virgin Islands Energy Office. She was a part-time university instructor, uh, legislative uh, chief of staff. She was the manager for environmental affairs uh, for the Vir Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority, assistant commissioner, um, uh, chief assistant chief executive officer of 
of Economic Development Authority and Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Again, you can see here just from her brief bio, uh, again, she certainly comes well qualified, can certainly handle the position, and again, it's just left for performance from this point onward. She's, she's, she's a veteran. Um, make no mistakes about it. Um, I think Alicia by far has prepared herself beyond any question, <clears throat> prepared to serve. Um, she's ready to go, well, well, well suited for the position. I think that with her background, she's going to be a tremendous, tremendous uh, benefit to the um, 33rd legislature. And I certainly her <laughs> constituents gave her that stamp of approval and that vote of confidence in, 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 in issuing the votes to her and running, of course, as number one in the St. Croix. Well, but, you know, the thing about not being an incumbent, when you run number one as a non-incumbent, people see your potential. I, I, I stole that from Senator Jane. Mm -hmm. He said that a couple times well. That they see your potential. When you are an incumbent, they want to see your record. But yes. as a non-incumbent, she did extremely well, and we look forward to great things from her. Our next candidate is our next semi-elect is Mr. Oakland Benter, who by far surprised a lot of people in winning this in this election. Uh, but again, I think he was well suited as well. What's his background? Well, uh, of course, he is. Uh, he was born on the island of, of Antigua. Uh, and uh, he has two brothers, Dave Benter. He migrated from Antigua to St. Croix um, with his mother, who is now deceased. Um, he has served as uh, in the Virgin Islands Police Department for the past 20 years. Uh, you know, he has served as director of the Training Bureau, uh, the director of the Governor Security Detail. He has been chief of police, you know. Um, and so he, ha he comes from a a police background, a law enforcement background, and uh, uh, you know he has served with various government and organizational um, uh, leaders in terms of bringing events and so forth together. He's a special assistant to the police uh, commissioner. So again, to well known to the public at least in, from the law enforcement standpoint, has walked his way up through the. Um, through the ranks, and certainly we can expect, if nothing else, but some discipline. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I was doing a little analysis at a number of individuals have recently taken the police to Senate route, and it was surprising. Like I said, a lot of people didn't really expect Benta to win, but he's, he was obviously chosen by the greater number of the masses um, as being qualified and ready. I think his experience in the legislature, I think he was um, working with you guys in the 32nd legislature as... As chief of security for the, for the legislature. And again, he had a number of ideas, new ideas that he wanted to introduce um, to bring about improvement in the famous uh, security aspect. And so again, I'm looking forward to the same type of enthusiasm, this, taking the same type of initiatives that he brought as, as chief to the... Um, to the legislature's chief security. I'm looking for him to bring those ideas now in the form of bills that would affect the lives of, in a positive manner. He seems, he seems very enthused to go forward and, and, and chomping at the bits to get ready to do the business. So we have Mr. Marvin A. Blyden, who is now, I, I understand, going to be the, uh, based on information that I have given so far, the majority leader of the 33rd legislature. Um, He's, he's broken all kinds of records as an as a, as a election buff. One of the only people to win for top vote, whether two consecutive terms in a row, really not heard of normally in normal politics. Um, I think he's on his third term. Or, uh, or, this this will be his third term, yeah. I, I got elected um, with Senator Blyden. And of course, I think Senator Blyden is to be admired. He has held his own. He has really shown tremendous growth. I mean, who am I to actually evaluate him because we got elected together. But I'm very proud of what he has done. Uh, he's a very quiet individual. Yeah, but, he's, indeed, he's very smart, but but, smart, but certainly smart. seems to be very powerful. Very, and, and that's what's most important, uh, you know. Um, he, he certainly has worked his way and garnered the respect of, of the, the senators-elect in terms of selecting him as a, a majority leader. And so I, I'm looking forward to his, uh, his leadership in this 32nd, 33rd legislature. He's, he's done a really good job. Um, 
He's, he's really a people person. I think the community really, really loves him. <clears throat> Excuse me again. He's done very well in terms of um, converting um, his, his verbiage into to actual votes. Um, so let's move on to Allison L. Degazon, um, a newcomer. She ran a very extraordinary campaign. I think it was ex an excellent campaign. Um, I'm, I'm sure with limited money, but did a really, really great job in getting her message out to the people. Well, I, you, you said limited money, but I, I certainly told you that she was quite impressive as I visited um, St. Croix and seeing all those signs and even hearing her ads on the radio. I think she, she ran a campaign second to none. And I, uh, I did want just quickly, we have Administrator Avery just entering the um, Emancipation Garden. Um, so we, we're going to cut in and out every now and then when somebody important comes in because uh, we want the community to be aware of the new leadership yes, in indeed. the executive branch. So we have Administrator Avery uh, who is going to be in charge of the St. Thomas, St. Saint Thomas, no, Saint Thomas, Saint Thomas, Saint Thomas, the island of St. Thomas. And uh, we have a uh, national committee woman, Ms. Carol Burke, Carol Burke of the Democratic Party sitting there. So we'll be in and out just letting you know who's who so that you might be able to capsulate their faces. Of course. Gee, uh, of course, yes. So, um, Ms. Digazana, again, I don't know her very well, but however, she is um, an entrepreneur coming out of St. Croix. She is the owner of Kujan Organic Farm Inc. and, and Business Strategies Inc. And uh, she is a proud uh, farmer, a diligent business person, and certainly want to um, transform agriculture into a, an economic um, cornerstone. I think that during every election, John, we often hear politicians talk about how viable agriculture is. And certainly, and of course, I'm seeing um, Judge Gomez. Oh, just the chief of the district court, yes. uh, Gomez, sitting next to my successor, Ms. Uh, Supervisor Carolyn Fox. Fox. Yes. Um, and like we said before, um, former uh, Senator Usi Richards, also a past, past Senate president, uh, I think of the 28th uh, legislature. Yeah. Um, the house is filling up very quickly. Filling mm -hmm. up very nicely. So, of course... Um, we have uh, former uh, governor. Yes, Charles, yes, Charles Turnbull. W. Turnbull. The Honorable. The Honorable W. Charles Turnbull entering the house. So, looks like we're going to have a pack house today. Most definitely. Uh, so, again, I was saying, John, that I, I think that what we're going to expect um, from Senator-elect uh, Dig, um, Alison Diggazan, I, I think that we're going to see agriculture, at least I will hope to see agriculture, being on the front burner, so to speak. Again, we just recognize the need for us to be able to feed ourselves and the importance of agriculture. And certainly she comes from that background and I expect to see her making it, taking initiatives. But, Jean, I, as, as a per, I, I have a Bachelor of, of Science in Agriculture, Animal Science. And you know, I, I sit and cringe every time I hear the Senate talk about agriculture because there are so many opportunities to make this work. It is an industry that has large and very, there is no product in the world that doesn't start from an agricultural base. Agriculture fuels everything, education, no matter what the subject is. My concern is this. I just hope we're not going to get more into it just because, again, and I'm putting a burden on you on this case as well. Every, every legislature, when it's campaign time, we have agriculture, agriculture. But when it's time to deliver a product, a strategic plan, money, tax incentives, something that will make the industry work, nothing happens. And I, I gotta be honest with you, I'm very frustrated about this. So I am. Well, you know, I, I think that that's a topic of great interest, and certainly I think that we're going to need much more time to discuss that at <laughs> length. I, I'm telling you, all I'm saying to you is, though, again, with her being you, in you the business, it's gonna be on the front I, I think it's going to be on the front burner. And so now we got to look and see what are the true stumbling blocks. Uh, is the stumbling block the fact that uh, um, agriculture is not being given attention by the politicians or by somebody else? or what other barriers there might be. So, so, so you do think it's going to be on the burn? But I, I, certainly, I, I certainly think so. I certainly think so. Okay. Next senator we have to discuss is Dwayne M. DeGraff. I think this is Dwayne's second term. Second as term. An independent candidate. 
uh, yes. in the legislature of the Virgin Islands. Green, of course, too. Uh, you know, I, uh, also I, from a police background. I uh, uh, just about to tell you that. I was able to serve with him in the 32nd legislature, also from a police background. And it seems as though we're going to have a, quite a number, of, at least three individuals in the Senate. Three or four, 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 four individuals, individuals. yeah. Three or four. There's Senator Dwayne, Dwayne DeGraff, there's uh, Senator Gittens, there will be Senator um, Nobel Francis, Nobel Francis, and we have and Mr. Mr. Oklambenta. Oklambenta. So yeah. we have like a real secure Senate now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but for, no, putting our jokes aside, again, um, the Graffin did really well in his term. I, I, I have been following him well. I think that he served with, um, with a certain level of um, exponential grace in, in, yes. in his position. He was, he crossed the aisle several times. He wasn't very, um, he wasn't very partisan. He was very bipartisan in his activities, and I look forward to great things from him this this particular term. Oh, yeah. in the legislature. He, he of course was a, is a very quiet individual, and of course he served in the minority um, across the aisle from us. And uh, you know, every now and then we got an opportunity to throw a little beat upon him. A, you know, a little, dab a little, a little <laughs> touch up. We we really wanted to encourage him though to come over and join us, and and. You know, but he was a little bit stubborn. Well, he held his own. <laughs> while, we're here, while we're here, let me just ask you that question because I get that question as a consultant, a political consultant, all the time. How do you ask someone to cross over? What, what is what is the internal mechanism? Now, I know what happened back in the day. I'm talking like what, what's the modern day mechanism? Because in this particular legislature, we have 13 Democrats and two independents in uh, Senator Saro and uh, DeGraff. How does someone from the majority go across the aisle and ask that person, come and be part of the group? How, how, how do we do it? Well, uh, and, I, and you were a secretary of the, the Senate, the, so the, you, you, <laughs> was right in, you was in the leadership. Well, well I, I can tell you that there is no clear definition of how it is to be done, um, or no prescription of how it is to be done. I think, um, basically, we bring forth the issues and we say, hey, look, this is the position in which we are going to be taking on this particular issue. We want you to come join us. Come join us. And again, the, the art of negotiation is always there. You know, we can certainly assist you in, in, in pushing your agenda forward. You know, once it's good, of course, and we believe in it for the community. However, I think that the, the last, in, in, in my tenure, the 31st and 32nd legislature, we pretty much took a different approach. and and. We wanted to be inclusive because many of us uh, did not understand the purpose of majority minority. And so we actually wanted to be inclusive. And so you will find that even though members, I, I, I can recall that there was a visitor here visiting from the States. He, he was um, a, a congressional leader from the States visiting with us. And he was wondering, how is it possible that in a democratic majority, we, we, uh, overwhelming of democratic 15 majority, people. Uh, 50, well, we, our, our majority was, was 10, 10 at that time. Of 15. Uh, of 15. And how is it possible that you can have a senator in the minority bringing forth legislation? Because he said in, in his thing, it's just, just it's doesn't happen. You're in the minority. You're in the minority. You don't the get bills. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't get bills, <clears> you know, um, to be at least aired. And so we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And then before my time, the legislature had already made, I think it was done in the 30th uh, legislature, we had then made the decision of giving equal allotment, whether or not you, 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 you 29. the 29. 29. Okay, thank you for the correction. <laughs> You know, so again, you know, I think that the idea, and this is all part of. Um, we have uh, Dr. Dr. Hall, Dr. Dr. Hall, Dr. Hall of yes. the university uh, entering the, the uh, Emancipation Garden with uh, Senator Positive Nelson. So I think as you were talking about um, seeing the millennials coming in into the leadership, I think you're going to see more of that, that people are going to be open. It doesn't really make a difference. Majority uh, uh, is only for organizational purposes and leadership of the organization, the institution itself. But, you know, in essence, we are all servants of the people. We have a former senator, president, president and former lieutenant governor, Mr. Valdez Richards. Um, really good guy, good senator, good mover, uh, mover and shaker. Like I said, we have also a positive, uh, Senator Positive Nelson um, entering Emancipation Gardens. Okay, our, our next Senate person will be Donna A. Fred Gregory. Who, no, I didn't skip um, Novell. Did I skip? Yes, I did skip Novell. Yeah. Novell E. Francis Jr., my junior mentor. Um, good guy, again, one of the Police security for 
Certainly, What's his background? Uh, I, law enforcement, of course. Um, I worked his way up through the ranks through the... Um, uh, he attended... Um, who is uh, that we have there? Uh, Carlton Dow. Carlton Dow, former uh, senator. Former senator and senator. former director of the Port Authority. That's correct. And Entry. Senator um, Roosevelt David. Uh, senator Roosevelt. Oh, I haven't seen oh, Roosevelt you, so can long. you missed that big smile there? Yeah, looking great, too. <laughs> oh, yes. So, Senator um, Francis, of course, uh, he went to the uh, criminal justice. He studied criminal justice at the John Jay College and, of course, later came back, joined the police department in 2011. He has worked himself up from through the ladder and pretty much have held all of the ranks you can possibly think of right up to the commissioner of police. Uh, again, he this is his third time that he will be um, serving in the in the 33rd legislature. And he, he has a lot of um, good pieces of legislation, I think, that behind. I was able to develop a friendship with him, and certainly we work very well together. He's a very level-headed individual. Chief Justice, Chief Justice Reese Richards. Reese Hodge. Reese Hodge. Reese Hodge, Hodge entering Reese Hodge. the uh, Emancipation Garden and heading to the band set. Um, Novell is a great guy and has a great background. As you said, he has by far proven beyond any reasonable doubt, working his way through the ranks from an actual patrol officer to become commissioner. A uh, very level-headed guy. Uh, kind of quiet also. He's a soft-spoken individual. Quiet. But, Carries but a big stick. Very Carries charismatic. A um, has a great personality. Um, gets the job done. He knows when to ask for help. I, and that's something that I've, I've noticed about most successful legislators. They generally know when to ask for help from the right people. He's always reached out whenever he's needed assistance. I, I think that he has proved himself beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, I'm sure that he was up for consideration as president. Um, and so him not getting the job, him not, him not getting the job um, is, is a whole other discussion, but um, I'm looking forward to great things from this particular legislature with Indeed. his involvement. Indeed. And of course, the, the next uh, uh, senator-elect, Senator Donna Fred Gregory, and of course, um, she here is a graduate of the Charlotte Amali High School. Uh, she again is the a, a product of the, the territory's public school system. Um, again, she holds a master's the uh, business arts from Western Governors University, a master of arts in public administration from the University of okay, Virgin uh, Islands. Really quick, Gene. Let's take a look. The senators appear oh. to be entering Emancipation Garden in their processional line. Look like they're headed to the no bandstand. No particular um, um, We have up form. right now, we have no particular form, but this is um, Stephen Payne, senator at large that we have uh, coming up now. Behind of him appears to be... Senator de Graff. Senator Francis, but well, we can see our yeah, Senator yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Janelle Saro. She's, yes. she's kind of stepped out so we can see her plainly. Um, it also looks like the graph, as you yeah, said, yeah, and yeah. Senator Novell Francis. So and Senator the, Jackson the, is Senator Jackson is in, is in the back. And so they're making their way up to the bandstand to uh, start the, the processional issue of the swearing-in ceremony. Uh, what time are we at here? What's we are hour? about two minutes after 10, and of course this event was scheduled to start uh, at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock. So they're, they're not too far the, No, on they're on time. time. I mean, no, um, as a parliamentarian, you know, every time I would come and talk to you guys, I would tell you, I'll start on time. Two minutes, give or take, you're, 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 you're in the clock. So uh, I, I, won't, I won't admonish them at this point, but they look like they want to be on time and get this business getting off the ground and get ready to um, start the activities. Yeah, I think, well, they are certainly ready to go, and I'm sure that they're anxious, particularly for the new ones. They're Here's my classmate, um, uh, Magistrate oh. Kathleen Mackay. Mackay. That's my classmate. We went to school together from uh, in, in St. Joseph. Uh, we graduated together. Very pensive individual. I'm glad that she's one of the individuals in the justice system. Okay. So, <clears throat> getting back to the bios, until we get more people coming in, Let's move on to Kenneth L. Gittin, who I understand is slated to be the Senate president. We just had the blowing of the conch shell, so I assume the ceremony is about to get underway. 
uh, we will defer to the ceremony once they get started. But in the meantime... Yeah, Senator Gittins, uh, Kenneth L. Gittins, of course, he is known as Kenny to many. Um, he grew up in, in the, he has a background with the Virgin Islands um, Police Department from 1990. He has an Associate of Science in, public, in Police Science from John Jay College. And, uh, you know, he has served in the 30th legislature, the 31st legislature, and now being re-elected to the 33rd. 33rd. <laughs> so he did skip one term there, which is the 32nd legislature. And I think we're getting I started. I think the ceremony is being against, so we'll turn it over to them. And those viewing or listening via television, radio waves, or social media, this day marks the installment of the 33rd legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands, where 15 members throughout the territory serve on a biennium basis. I am Dr. Dion Simmons, and I humbly preside as your mistress of ceremonies. However, if you say just Dion, simply Dion, or absolutely Dion, that's me. As the newly elected legislative body's theme denotes, restoring unity and trust through vision and purpose, it is interrelated with the leaders who join in supporting this commemorative event today. Please assist me in extending honor and a warm welcome to the dignitaries that we have present with us today. Please help me welcome, who is present, our former governor, Charles Wesley Turnbull. Please stand. Our former lieutenant governors, is anyone in the house? I believe earlier I saw uh, Bargrave Richards. Hi, welcome. Any senators, former senators in the house, could you please stand and be recognized? Good morning, welcome. Thank you so much for your service. Are there any commissioners in the house? That's the governor's cabinet. Can you please stand and be recognized? Good morning, commissioners. Directors, administrators of the governor's cabinet, please stand. Thank you and good morning. Thank you for your service. Representing the third branch of government, the judiciary. Among us are the Honorable District Court Judge Curtis B. Gomez. Good morning. Are there any justices present? I know the Honorable Chief Justice Reese S. Hodge should be among us. He is administering the oath today. Yes. Good morning. Superior Court Presiding Judge Michael C. Dunstan, as well as the other judges and magistrates that are here with him today, please stand and be recognized, judges. Thank you so much. At this time, great leaders, they need prayer. But before I do that, let me digress and please extend honor where honor is due. Hailing from the British Virgin Islands, we have the Speaker of the House Assembly, Honorable Ingrid A. Moses Scottliffe. Please stand. <laughs> Joining her today is the Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. The Honorable Orlando Smith is not here. However, Minister of Health and Social Development, he is here, Honorable Marlon A. Penn. Junior Minister for Trade and Investment Promotion, the Honorable Alvera Keynes. Junior Minister for Tourism, the Honorable Dr. Hubert O'Neill. Territorial Member, Honorable Archibald C. Christian. 
and leader of the opposition and territorial member, the Honorable Ronnie W. Skelton. With much pump and circumstance, I duly recognize our distinguished senator-elects, their families and friends who stand proudly in support of their valiance and commitment to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. We thank you. And now, in awe and reverence to the great I am, who is worthy, he is Adonai, who is going to usher in his presence today is the Reverend Dr. Winnell Curtin Roberts, who will render our invocation. If you are able to stand, I invite you to stand as we go before God's throne. Eternal Lord and God, in you we live, we move, and we have our very being. Because of you, almighty God, we can rejoice and be glad. For this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Through you, gracious God, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, and we are blessed. How can we say thanks to you, O oh God, for all the things that you have done for us? How can we say thanks to you, O oh God, for the blessings we have received but do not deserve? How can we say thanks to you, O oh God, for being a refuge and strength, especially in times of trouble? Like the songwriter, we declare, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Of all the candidates that have offered themselves to serve in the 33rd legislature, there are 15 that will take the oath of office today. Stephen D. Payne, Jr., Kenneth Gittins, Novell Francis, Kurt Vialli, Alicia Barnes, Alison de Gazon, Oakland Bento, Javan James, Marvin Blyden, Dwayne de Graff, Athneil Bobby Thomas, Myron Jackson, Janelle Soreau, Donna Fred Gregory, and Stedman Hodge. These senators have been duly elected to serve the United States Virgin Islands, not because of their strength, not yet because of the efforts of their supporters, but because it is the will of God. For we believe your word when you say that all authority comes from God, and those in position of authority are placed there by God. We therefore pray that all senators will be careful to give attention to the hard work and sacrifice of those who have legislated from the times of the Colonial Assembly to the most recent 32nd legislature. For it is when we are knowledgeable of our history that we can make more informed decisions to serve all. We pray that every senator will understand that personal passion, charisma, and popularity are all but useless if they as leaders do not work together to get the job done. We therefore ask for unity of vision and purpose. We pray that every senator will remain connected to the concerns of the people and seek to be vigilant in addressing specifically the needs of our youth and find solutions to stop the unnecessary violence and crime that is wiping out a generation of our men. We pray that the Holy Spirit will direct the deliberations of our senators 
as they work with the executive and judicial branches of government. And we pray that our senators will be good examples of why stewardship, honesty, respect, and integrity. In a time when a solution to the shutdown of the federal government is not in sight, the rebuilding of the territory after the storms is far from over, and the patience of our people is waning thin. I pray that every senator will put God first and rely on God's strength to guide and sustain them. And so we commend to your providential care and keeping their families, loved ones, staff, and supporters. May we also, as your people, give words of encouragement and continue to be supportive in their efforts, knowing that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Reverend Roberts. And now we will have the posting of the colors followed by the processional march.
Governor and uh, Lieutenant Governor of Virgin Islands appear to be entering the uh, Spacer Gardens through the uh, processional area. So let's keep a lookout for both um, Governor Albert Bryan and Lieutenant Governor Trudenza Roach. Apparently they're already in the bandstand. Yes. As you can see, it looks like Trudenza is with his mother and uh, Governor Bryant is with his wife, Miss Yolanda Brown. Here comes the senators now. Oh, here comes the senators official. make the official entrance into the uh, bandstand area. On the red carpet. Over the red carpet. Pretty interesting group. They're, of course, being greeted by the crowd with applause. It's an interesting group that they're bringing into the Senate. Um, it appears that they have the wives and, and significant others uh, intertwined into the group. They'll be making their formal entrance. <clears throat> I'm assuming that after this we have had the invocation, so we'll be moving right on to the national anthem that will be sung by apparently by Miss Lana Freeman, um, a regular to these kind of events and, and, a, and a great soprano. Everyone sharing their kisses with goodwill wishes. You know, this is always an <laughs> important day for me because it's the only day in the Virgin Islands Senate when there's no discourse. Well, at least at this point. I, you're laughing like I'm making a joke. You're, 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 you're I'm trying being, words. No, I, no I, I'm, I'm not trying I'm being honest. That, you know, they're going to be good now when they're here at this location. This is the ceremonious portion. 
it's like, um, well, you know, John, I, I think it's important to point out that um, the Senate is a deliberative body. And that's the uh, point. And, that's and, the whole and, point. And, and it's, 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 it's a supposed good to have thing. Discourse. Yeah, it, it's a good thing. It's a it's, good thing. I believe in opposition politics. It's supposed to have discourse. Most definitely. It's supposed to have discourse. But today's the ceremonious portion. And in the, in the glimmer and gleam of, of the great day, I, I applaud them for what they do here today. The actual oath of office, that activity. Um, and like you said, the kissing and hugs from the general public, from the community at large, from each other. This uh, is the moment, of course, that you stand proud amongst your, your colleagues, your amongst and, your and family, your, your friends, your supporters. And, and so right now I'm, I'm suggesting that most of those individuals, they're so overwhelmed. It's a certain degree of pride that is, it, it's, it, they're feeling it, right it just now. Takes, so we have um, Senator-elect Donna Gregory looking regal as ever. Um, I think that she's going to be a very a compelling force in the 33rd legislature. Um, Certainly not, going to be vocal, to say the least. She's not, she's not new to Virgin Islands politics, has been in a few positions um, throughout the government. Um, I think she was Commissioner of Education when they had the, um, uh, that, that thing with the, uh, the edict for the money. Yes. Uh, we have uh, young Javon Senator James, Javon the youngest James. senator in the Virgin Islands legislature. And again, very soft-spoken individual, yes. but he's has he's gathered a lot of respect since he's been elected. Yes, Russia. yes, indeed. And Senator Stedman Hodge. Stedman Hodge. steady has been around for a little while. He's. Uh, but he too seems to be very quiet at times. Uh, we but, have uh, Senator uh, Kurt Lee. Virgin Islands, please help me in welcoming His Excellency, the ninth Governor of the Virgin Islands, Mr. Albert Bryan Jr. and Lieutenant Governor. Tregenza Roach Esquire. <laughs> Following our program, the national anthem will be sung by the lady that owns the keys to the Virgin Islands, Miss Lorna Freeman. Followed by the Virgin Islands anthem sung by Mr. Gilchrist Sprouve, followed thereby after by the Black National Anthem, and that will be sung by Miss Melita Etienne. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight last evening, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the
be seated. And now I have the distinct uh, pleasure to extend remarks on behalf of the 33rd legislature. When asked to give remarks, 
I sought the wisdom of my first cousins, who sternly suggested I smile, be funny, and don't be stiff. Since these events will be broadcast on Facebook Live, where every troll, antagonist, detractor, and unrelenting critic will anxiously await your flubs, fashion faux pas, and quirky mannerisms. It is in this exchange the theme of leader was unearthed and the burdens assigned to leadership. It has been my observation, and many may agree, whenever one assumes the position of the spotlight or forefront, they expose themselves to celebrators, tolerators, or crucifiers. In this commentary, we may even answer the age-old question of whether leaders are born or made, but its expressed purpose is to edify and evoke a call to action in the looming 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands. In searching for the etymology of the word leader, in antiquity, leader translates to terms such as ruler, guide, prefect, governor, and sovereignty. Due to this preliminary finding, a few common elements emerge in leaders. Honorable Kenneth Gittens, Honorable Donna Fret Gregory, Honorable Marvin A. Blyden, Honorable Othnell Bobby Thomas, Honorable Myron D. Jackson. Vision. Leaders are visionaries who share with others. Honorable Stedman Hodge, Jr. Honorable Novell E. Francis, Jr. Honorable Allison Degazan. Honorable Alicia Barnes. Honorable Javon James. Motivate. Leaders are the best at calling others to action. Honorable Kurt Verley. Honorable Oakland Benta. Honorable Stephen D. Payne, Sr. Honorable Janelle K. Saru. Honorable Dwayne M. DeGraff. Leaders serve. Leadership is synonymous with servitude. It requires an intentional emptying of yourself. In other words, leaders, wash feet. Risk takers. Leaders take risks because they understand if I am not first fearful, I cannot embrace courage. Leaders, continuous improvement because good is the enemy of great. A leader's attitude is demonstrative of looking for something different and even creating something out of nothing. As we study the resume of a leader and acknowledge the theme of restoring unity and trust through vision and purpose, a leader's repertoire is incomplete without arete. This Greek word means having an attitude of excellence that is entwined to purpose. Senator Alex, if you have arete, you will have a desire to achieve excellence in all, no matter what. Let me break it down. If excellence, arete, is a part of your DNA in any given situation, you will not know how to respond in any other way than making it excellent. Listen, having so much excellence and purpose in you will automatically catapult you into leadership because there would be no other option. Arete is just excellence and greatness. It's also purpose. Your purpose is greatness, and it is a personal mission. While visiting Burj Khalifa in Dubai, this profound quote by the nation's ruler was inscribed in the wall of this edifice. And I quote, the word impossible is not in a leader's dictionary. No matter how big the challenge is, 
strong faith, determination, and resolve will overcome them. That's the Sheikh Mohammed Ben Rashid Al Maktoum. So what does the people of the Virgin Islands expect from our leaders? Now that our leadership have plotted a different course, and restoration of unity, trust, vision, and purpose is a promised horizon? Yes, we want innovations, formidable transportation, transformation of our economy, immediate actions in the technological sector, infrastructure and beautification, addressing the plight of health and mental health, and asserting a hands-on approach to every social ill facing our communities. But most importantly, leaders, what we want more than anything else is your humility and the servant's heart. So whether you were number one as the top vote getter, or in the words of former Senator Celestino A. White when addressing a colleague on the Senate floor, you old number seven, you. You have a yeoman's job ahead. Virgin Islanders everywhere beseech your leadership in making us proud. Finally, marinate on this quote like the finest cut steak. And if you're vegan, tofu. Most people talk, we do things, they plan, we achieve, they hesitate, we move ahead. We are living proof that when human beings have the courage and commitment to transform a dream into reality, there is nothing that can stop them. Mic drop. Thank you. And now, this is the moment we have all been waiting for. The reading of certification and presentation of senators. Ms. Carolyn F. Fox, please come forward. This will be followed by the administration, I am sorry, of the oath of office by the Honorable Chief Justice, Reese S. Hodge. Good morning. Protocol being established, distinguished platform guests, ladies and gentlemen. Pursuant to Virgin Islands Code, Title 18, Chapter 3, Section 47, as the Supervisor of Elections, I do certify that on November 16, 2018, all duties relative to the certification of the results of the general election of November 6, 2018 has been completed and it, is, and it has been determined by all valid votes cast in the election that the following persons have been elected members of the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands. I now present the legislators as your name is alphabetically announced, please stand to be recognized and then be seated. Senator at Large, St. John, Stephen D. Payne, Sr. <laughs> Senators, District of St. Croix, Alicia Barnes. Oakland Benta. <laughs> Allison Digazon. <laughs> Novel E. Francis Jr. <laughs> Kenneth L. Gittins.
Javon James. Kurt Biele. Senators, District of St. Thomas, St. John, Marvin Blyden. Dwayne DeGraff. Donna Fred Gregory. Stedman Hodge Jr. Myron D. Jackson. Janelle K. Soro. Atneil Thomas. Will all the members of the 33rd legislature please stand? Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the members of the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands. Okay, we're going to take the oath. When I say I, all, each, all of you say I together, and then individually, starting with the pain, you'll say your name individually all the way, then repeat after me. I. I. Aaron D. Jackson. Kenneth L. Gitton. Oakland Venter. Do solemnly swear, Do solemnly swear that, I that I will support, obey, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States applicable to the Virgin Islands and the laws of the Virgin Islands. And the laws of the Virgin Islands. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of senator. Discharge the duties of senator. Of the 33rd Legislature of the 33rd Legislature of the United States Virgin Islands. Of the United States Virgin Islands. With fidelity. With fidelity. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Senator. Congratulations, Senators. And now we will have a musical selection by Miss Lorna Freeman 
and it will be followed by valiant Virgin Isles. Thereafter, we will have the retiring of the colors. Good morning. Good morning, citizens of the Virgin Islands. This morning we will present Valiant Virgin Isles. We have the privilege of being joined by a delegation from St. Croix. <laughs> Through this song we aim to model the change that we expect to see. Joined together, St. Croix, the largest of the three.
Valiant Virgin Isles. The traitors' faithless acts that saved their masters' backs. For six months they were free. God gave us wisdom as we stand firm in perfect unity. Together, victory can be ours. We cannot bow to powers that threaten liberty.
Alpha and Omega, everything has a beginning and an end. Bringing forth our benediction this afternoon is the Right Reverend Edward Ambrose Gums. As it was in the beginning, so it will be in the end. Gracious and ever-living God, you have raised up men and women to serve you as they serve others. Pour out your spirit on the women and men who were sworn in today as the 33rd legislature and on all those who will surround them in service to the Virgin Islands community. Make them mindful of their calling and anointing so that they may work together for the common good. Give them a spirit of cooperation, that they may serve for the benefit of all the people. Give them a spirit of humility, that they may listen to the cries of the little people. Give them a discerning heart, that they may gain wisdom from those who may appear foolish, but out of whose mouths wisdom from God will flow. Lord, your word says, when the righteous is in authority, the people rejoice. You know all about the suffering of your people. You have heard their complaints. You now have called these servants to address the present situations. In all they do, may your will and only your will be done. God is watching. The people are expecting and praying. And now... May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his light up upon you and give you his peace. In God's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. As the recessional march commences, on behalf of the 33rd Legislature of the Virgin Islands, we offer our congratulations and we grant you peace as we expect great things. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.
done, here we have it. Uh, the new 33rd legislature has been sworn in. Individuals are now walking down the stairs, congratulating everyone, congratulating each other. You know, this is an interesting moment, John. I can recall on the 32nd legislature swearing day. It was a very awkward moment because, right. of course, at that point, we only swore in 14 senators. Exactly, that, that is true. That, very that, awkward moment. That, but that, today, that, at least, we, yeah, have, we, have, we have a full, a full compliment. compliment. You, you know, when we were watching, we were watching the swearing in, a couple of times I saw that glimmer in their eye, a few people had to almost held, held back those tears because, as you said, it is an overwhelming, overwhelming oh, yes, feat indeed. to just know now you are charged with the responsibility of guiding a community of 110,000 people and that their fate all rests in your hands. And I, I, You've been there. I've, awesome. I've never been a senator, but you've been there, Gene. Yes, and, and I just awesome. think I just think that is an awesome responsibility. And and uh, by the way, I gotta keep going back to the issue. Nine new people with a brand new, untested governor is quite a feat for all well, the young individuals to be looking at. But in, indeed, and of course, you know, John, the theme of the new administration was change. Change, right. Uh, and, change course. And, and change course. And so indeed, we expect to see certain changes. And I, and I can tell you, it is an expectation that the public have expressed. They expressed it through their vote. They exist, have expressed it in words. Again, it's to come about, the question is change from what to what. So the big question now is, um, they're going to be heading to the to the big house now or over to the legislature? Right now they're going to go to the legislature where they are going to have a ceremony. It uh, is expected that a resolution is going to be put forth in terms of the organization, individual of the legislature, individuals who are chairing committees, individuals who will hold offices uh, of the legislature. And so we'll see where it takes there. Much rumor has been spread. Um, we already know, uh, furthermore, it's rumored that, um, that Senator Gittins will serve as the president, president. and Senator Donna Fred Gregory will serve as the vice president. I notice that they're standing together throughout this whole ceremony, they're seated together. I don't know if that's by design. Um, I hope so, <laughs> I, I hope so, I, something will come. But, but Gene, okay, after the ceremonious issues are done now, we are going to the organizational structure of the legislature They'll be making, as you said, the resolutions and the activities. They'll be giving their personal uh, privileges of the floor where they'll be able to speak and, and give their information. What do you think should be the priorities of this 30, 33rd legislature? You know, we have some real serious issues, specifically in mental health, um, in crime. Um, today is the 12th, uh, 14th of January, and in St. Croix, we've already had four homicides in St. Croix. Um, education is in a flux. Former education chairman, um, committee chairman, how do you prioritize now? How do they get back, and just for the edification of the public, how do we tell them these are important issues that we want them to take a look at? Well, I, I, I think, uh, of course, and, and we left out one. We talk about mental health, we talk about crime, and we talk about education. And, of course, we often hear that uh, on a regular basis, that these are the issues to be tackled. There's one other issue, though, that I want to suggest, and that is a question of finances. Again, you know very well that Everything we suffered at, at the hands of two hurricanes, and we heard of the promises of all this money, billions of dollars that's available. Eight hundred billion, eight eight hundred eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars. Eight billion. Eight billion. Yeah, that's available to us. The question is, and in most people's mind, is that they're not seeing that money actually coming here as yet. They're not seeing evidence of that money playing a, a, a role in our community. So we have rebuilding. A lot of people are still suffering. A lot of people still have their homes that are not settled. They're wondering what next, you know. And of course, again, my, my passion is for education. And uh, in the Department of Education, we are still not seeing schools fixed. Not we're still, great for sure. We're, we're still hearing that they're doing uh, they're great. doing assessments. And at this late date, I don't think that 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 we can say or, or use the excuse too much about um, 
doing assessments. I don't think that's what people want to hear. People want to see progress. People want to see results. People want um, schools to be repaired, uh, you know, so that again, we don't deprive our youngsters of, of an appropriate and adequate uh, education. But I, I think there's th something was thrown in the mix. Like, at least me, I've heard on the news, <clears throat> national news lately, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, President Trump is now considering taking some of the uh, recovery monies from both Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, California, and Texas to consider billing as well. I know that's a completely different subject, but it does directly affect how we're being viewed and the importance of the recovery effort. And, and, and I, and I, and I got to give credit where credit is due that our delegate has certainly stepped in and has been vocal about it. And I think that she, is, she has promised to do all that she can to avert that. Of course, now, you know, I know that she has limited powers in terms of what she can do. But again, those are the issues, again, it, it is something to worth, worthwhile mentioning because those are the issues that is going to affect all of the areas that we mentioned. Education, crime, you and know, housing, all, all of them will all be affected. health services, all of, them all will be of the issues it's going to be affected. So that is something, it's an awesome task the 33rd legislature is being faced with. So we, I, we've got to keep our eye on that because the importance of that is for us to make sure that we don't lose sight of the issue that we have to um, keep in mind that although we've been promised all these funds, it's not necessarily important that they are there and present and available. With that said, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, introduce our guests. Uh, we have with us uh, Senator Positive Nelson uh, that has recently joined us for a small interview so that we can... We still are, okay. We want to, again, introduce my guest, our guest, Senator Positive Nelson, to have a small interview with us about uh, the legislature. Um, this is the first time in years, Senator, that you won't be actually on the podium. How, yeah. I, how does that feel? I, I, I mean... Uh, well, you know, it's a, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's a somewhat emotional moment. It's been 14 years uh, in service uh, in the legislature, so as you witness the, the new senator being sworn in, good morning. You know, you, you you feel it for them because I know at almost at every swearing in, it's, you know, I was here. Yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, it's different. It's different. It's different. Yeah, because here you are being honored with the ability to serve your people. So I can bet that they are feeling that same emotional. That, that yeah, emotional. And I saw a couple of them tear up just. Well, like and, and, and rightfully so, you know, and rightfully so. So here I am now watching, and I'm I'm grateful. I'm I'm happy for the hope of the Virgin Islands. We have a new governor. We have a new Senate, and I'm just willing and be able to be here to be as supportive as possible because at the end of the day, it's all of us. Well, you have made several, well, we've been on several talk shows together yes. and you've made several commitments that you stand ready still to serve and assist in any way humanly possible, especially those in the legislature. So I, I commend you for that. Oh. I wanted to be the first to congratulate you on your recent achievement of getting the uh, cannabis legislation through the legislature. I know that has been a long fought long hard fight for you um, I think your determination and your diligence to get that done has been beyond question and I just wanted to congratulate you for establishing your own personal legacy one way or the other your name will always be associated with you uh, well you know and at first I, I must say at some point I did have some complications with it because I'm like, I don't want to be known I know exactly mainly what you mean. for <laughs> marijuana or cannabis but you know I, 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 I'm amongst the ranks of you know, I've been known as advocacy, uh, Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, and now another Rasta man joined them positive. So I'm okay with it, you know, I, 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 I support where the trend is going. I feel like there's a lot of economic opportunity, a lot of great health opportunities. So I'm thankful that we have, my, and thank my colleagues who eventually supported the, the Bill 32.0135, the Medicinal Cannabis Patient Care Act. And I'm very hopeful that this new administration and the new governor signed it into law and we actually start rolling out regulations so that uh, people in the Virgin Islands can participate in the business of cannabis. You know, people think when you say marijuana, people talk about sitting down smoking weed. We're talking about multi-billion dollar, dollar uh, corporations now being established. So I'm on board with that and I'm grateful that uh, I've had the opportunity to like lead that fight here. And to be honest, I'm going to be joining the, the national and international advocacy until we have governments of the world to rest this thing down because it's time for it. It's time to erase the stigma and to get loose with the economics around it. 
So, so in, interesting that you, you said that you don't want to be known, and of course, of, you know... Not to be known only, only for that. Right. Pretty much if there's it. one piece of legislation or one thing that you want to be known as, what would that be in your tenure? I want to be known for the demand for accountable, efficient government. I want to be known for the demand for improved infrastructure because we keep talking about all this kind of development, but people aren't going to come to our place when we don't have basic things like 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 hospitals, like when the roads aren't even decent to drive, and when it's bushy and dirty along the side of the road, when our utilities are out of the sky. So, you know, when tele, you know, you can go almost anywhere and get get uh, internet service uh, uh, and cellular service all in the hills. We can't do that here. How many places in the Virgin Islands doesn't have running water and and, and and electricity where people can build? So, I want to be known for that demand. My even even in, in my promotion and advocacy for cannabis initially is for revenue to help with the infrastructure. So, yes, I get it, and cannabis marijuana is the big issue, but I want to be known for my, when I started in this, I mean, even someone will probably remember a little more than you that, I was talking about the corruption in government. I was talking about, because I came out of teaching, and that's where my fight really began, and it's always been there, but I know cannabis is a big issue, so I just don't want him to say, well, Rastaman and marijuana, and that's all you and decide well, and push. Well, but I, I, I get it. I accept whatever it is that comes I can associate with you with your economic bill that you are trying to pursue. Yeah, I, yeah they I do a the, lot of work the on The Infrastructure that. I, I Reconstruction know, Act, exactly. Right. I don't know if a lot of people paid attention no. to that, but it wasn't like you just pulled it out of the sky. I, you brought in a lot of experts. You, you got mm -hmm. some, as I said earlier to your colleague, uh, Senator Ford, that you, you set the basis of, of them giving you, you got expert help. That's yes, basically yes, where I'm going. Yes, yes, to, yes. to set the form for that. And, and that's what I, I've i always said. If they had just listened to positive, a little bit about that bill, yes, yes. we would have been a lot better off than yeah, we are. Yeah, no, give, me, give me a word. Yeah, yeah, you, you're exactly right. It's called the Infrastructure Reconstruction Act. And most people, you know, unfortunately, Macaulay sort of tossed it on the carpet because it was too big for most of them to really grasp. <laughs> but here you talk about restructuring the debt it, because it, it was a big plan. It was a big plan that called and, and for... That was, that's critical. It called for a total debt restructuring with some residuals to invest in the infrastructure. And this was at a time before the hurricanes, way before the hurricanes, way before everybody talking about it now. And had we done... And, that, and the market was better too. Twice the, as good. The, Twice the as good. was ready Twice for us. Good. Remember, Morgan Stanley came in here. They flew some of the top executives to our territory with our profile in hand. They pretty much advise us, especially when it relates to energy. We could have had energy production, new energy production on the south side of St. Croix and new generators here a long time ago. So yes, I thank you for remembering that, Ms. Abramson. It's called the Infrastructure Reconstruction Act. It was introduced from since uh, 2010 or thereabout. And, uh, so, so let's not let it die. I have okay. one more question Please, for you. Good. Thank you. What's next for Positive Nelson? What's next? <laughs> you, you know, that's uh, the no, 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 big question. question. I, I am here to serve. I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, you know, as you know, I have expertise in numerous areas. Uh, I, I just recently came from, and I'm going to be in the March issue of a dope magazine. They're the old, new owners of High Times. The Virgin Islands is getting a lot of attention as it relates to this, this cannabis movement. So I'm here to serve. The administration may want to talk. I'm here to serve the people and ensure that the people of the Virgin Islands get a better government. I'm here to push for advocacy of cannabis, not only here, but around the world. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm here to just leave the world like Michael Jackson say, heal the world and make it a better place. Exactly what it's going to look like, <laughs> what that job label or title might look like, I don't know. It's left to be but seen. Yeah, but I'm here to work. Okay, positive is how I live and that's as real as it gets. So expect to see me involved in this community and the global community. I, I want to thank you for your interview today you know, and for being here so with us. Thank and you I want to thank you all. It was a pleasure working with you. And you likewise, uh, right. to, um, to let everyone know that the 14th and, uh, annual Taste of uh, Two Islands will be held on January 17, 2019. There are limited numbers of tickets, so get yours now at the following outlets. You can get tickets at the ticket outlets to at the Reuse Emporium, Chelsea's Drug Store in Red Hook, Fortress Storage, Urban Threads, West Bay Supermarket, and you can go online to WTJX.org. Dance to the sounds of cool sessions with taste and bites of, uh, taste bites of items. Sample some of the wines from around the world, delicious foods, some of the best chefs from St. Thomas, St. John. The taste will be held at the MCM Center on Antilles Campus on Thursday, January 17th from 6 to 10 p.m. The shuttle will be running from Haven site to MCM Center beginning at 6 p.m. And for more information, call 690-7293. So let's introduce our next guest. We have with us the honorable former Senate President and former Lieutenant Governor, 
Mr. All Around Nice Guy, Valgrave Richards, welcome. Glad to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Good. I'm hoping, uh, with all of the new things happening, Valgrave, you're one of the people that we can really ask the hard questions. Uh, one of the issues I wanted to get to is we have a change in, in governor, we have a change in Senate. Um, what's the best way? You, you've always been a, a joiner, at least in, in my time knowing you. You've always been a joiner. What's the best way for them to work together to accomplish what needs to be done? I mean, it's, it's so much to be done. As, as my colleague here said, I'm sure all of them feel, felt overwhelmed at getting sworn in, but I'm sure they're going to feel twice as overwhelmed with the amount of work that's facing them. How, how, to, how to bring them together? Well, f well, first of all, I, uh, I congratulate all of the winners, all the senators here today, from Senate President uh, Giddens and the remainder of the, the body. Uh, first of all, I think they have something very unique. Unlike most legislatures, they are Democratic senators, the majority by far. You have a Democratic uh, governor of the U.S. Virgin Isles and lieutenant governor, and I Congress. think, and, and, and Congress. It behooves them, uh, the leadership, uh, the president of the legislature, and the governor, as well as the delegate, okay. to um, come together, first of all, uh, in, a, in a meeting with an understanding, with, uh, uh, with understanding that there are some primary issues that must be tackled immediately. Those may be economic, social, and otherwise. However, the, the leadership can dictate the direction of, of the, the legislature and, and the governor as well. Together, they would be able to move forward easier if there is such a meeting of minds, so to speak. So, so again, Gene, you got so, a question? Well, so, I just wanted to ask him, though. So you are recommending that before they even address and set the agenda, should they meet with the administration? I'm, do, I'm very do, do careful about recommending. <laughs> I was asked a question about what I think should take hold. Uh, I, I, do you think that's the route to go there? I, I believe yes. I believe since, especially because they are Democrats, uh, they have, uh, well, uh, innate um, responsibility to the Democratic Party and the people of the Virgin Islands to sit down and outline what are the the priorities for the let's say the first two years? I, and, and I'm glad you said that because one of the issues during the campaign for most of the Democratic from the Democratic Party was the issue of unity. I, I think they pushed that a lot. Um, they were taking pictures together, and, and of course they, they had a number of candidates. Everybody couldn't win, but the bottom line is they were pushing for Democratic unity both on the uh, gubernatorial level as well on the senatorial level and and I agree with you I think that we should look forward to them um, having some kind of meeting of the minds that they can uh, set a direction that they can all march towards you know, you know quickly I mean there are some glaring issues once you begin whether it's the economic issue we have a lot of federal money as you know that uh, is before us what do we do in the matching funds because I think in some of those monies that are coming down from the federal government it requires a match that's that requires a legislature participation and that is something right off the top of the bat I think the executive branch the governor and the president and the leadership of the 33rd legislature can sit down and decide how we're going to move forward and make sure we don't uh, squander or lose some of those those uh, revenue. Well, you've heard the wisdom from our former Senate president, two former Senate president and lieutenant governor. Um, I want to thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. Appreciate the time. I thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to look forward right. to our next uh, individual that we'll be interviewing. <laughs> I think we're going to be making a swap out here and have with us our next interviewee, which is the also former senator. We have former senator and presently, he's president or chief executive officer. Which one of the titles? President you and CEO of the West Indian Company Limited. President and CEO. This is a powerful real. guy we have with us. Yeah, this is a today. powerful guy for real. So, um, changing. Yo, give us your prognosis of what you just saw happen. Um, some direction of where you think we should be heading um, and how your agency is going to work with the new administration, the new Senate. Give us some words. Well, it was kind of bittersweet for me because, of course, I remember 
um, several years ago, I was up there raising my right hand and taking the oath. So yeah, everybody gets some, a feeling, don't yeah, they? Like, yeah, that's like, some memories <laughs> for me. And, did you and, tear up too? No, no, I did not tear, <laughs> did not tear up. But I was sitting next to my former <laughs> colleagues and former senators. So um, all of us were there looking. Of course, the newest one was Positive Nelson that was there um, sitting with us. But, you know, th th there's a lot of work ahead of us for the new administration, for the new um, first branch of government. And as you know, I was the finance chair for the four years that I was in the legislature. And just off the back, I know the administration and the 33rd legislature have to deal with this pension um, obligation, the pension issue. How do you fund GRS? How do you take care of that unfunded mandate, which is about $3 billion right now? Um, again, there's also the lowering issue with the health care and the hospital not being compensated for the uncompensated care. Um, is it the hospital's responsibility for taking care of people that really don't have insurance, or is that the government responsibility? And if you're not giving the hospital the uh, um, Revenues. an allotment or, or appropriation that's equal to uncompensated care, then you actually set them up to fail. So there's a lot of pressing issues that's going on here in the territory, and there's no time to learn on the job. You have to hit the ground running. You, you sound like you're still in the Senate, man. You sound <laughs> just like you're still in the Senate, but I, I can know from your present position, um, how do you see them being able to assist the territory in bringing in revenues to address some of the things that we, we basically have to work with right now? Well, of course, from, from my perspective, we're going to do everything we can at the West Indian Company Limited to grow the cruise industry. Um, but you know, we are at that critical point right now in the cruise season here or the cruise um, tourism mecca here in St. Thomas um, in particular, we are um, stretched to the limit in terms of our bird capacity, especially on the Tuesday, Wednesday, which becomes a critical point for a seven day cruise that starts on the Saturday, Sunday. Um, the, the, the size of the ship will continue to get larger and larger and right now the West Indian Company can birth three of their normal size ship today but with the ships continuing to stretch we can easily go down to two burton instead of three so for us to continue growing the cruise industry here we have to look at bringing alternative birth or additional birth to this district so that we can maximize the amount of cruise traffic that we can get here particularly on a tuesday and a wednesday and so let me ask you um if you don't mind let me just interject here and ask you give us a little idea of the status of the long bay landing where are we with that? We know that we started with one administration. That concept apparently changed and was going someplace else. Now we have a new administration. In your views, where are we with that? Is that a done deal? Uh, do you have to go back and talk with the administration? Well, one of the things that happened when I first came on the job is I, I met with the board and I kind of found out from the board why, what was the reason why the Long Bay Landing was taken off the table and they put on the record what the reasons were and I addressed each one of the reasons and brought it back to the board and they were pleased to see that, that I addressed the issues that they had and they revised Long Bay Landing as we call it was back on the table and basically it was taking the original design and shifting it towards the east a little bit more to, to kind of facilitate the flow of the passengers sure. to, to the Yacht Haven and the Havenside Mall because one of, the, one of the things that we want to be cognizant of, whatever we do, we don't want to put retail in a new um, pair that's coming because there's retail at the Havenside Mall, there's retail downtown, and there's retail in Crown Bay. So we want people to go and spend money in the retail that's already existed. So we shifted a little bit more to the east to facilitate the flow of passengers back to the GRS mall to, to really help the GRS system because the, the more traffic you have there is the higher the rent can be and the better it is for, for the government employee retirement system. So it was back on the table and we are actually finalizing a drawing now um, to go forward and do a community um, engagement, a community um, charrette if you may, um, and where people can sit in and give us the option, the opinion, and then, and then we can tell them our vantage point, how we got to Long Bay Landing. Um, in the so as it relates to, to the new administration coming in, it's not off the table. I mean, it, how does it work with the transition team is, and so forth? It is not off of the table, okay. but I would say with the West Indian Company Limited being one of three entities under the port of the Virgin Islands, we have to sit with the new Commissioner of Tourism and the new head of the Virgin Island Port Authority um, and then finalize a plan so we can go forward and do the community sharing. So I would say for right now, the plans are and stand still until 
we know who will be the Commission of Tourism, who will be the head of the Virgin Island Port Authority so we can move forward as the port to the Virgin Island. One more quick question just before you go. Um, everybody wants to know why you all keep your job. You know, that's this transition about who's getting fired or who's not getting fired. Let them know that you're, still, you're, you're comfortable and are going to be where you are. No, well, I'm comfortable because you share very comfortable. <laughs> I, I really have to comment WTJX for having some comfortable chairs here. Um, no, typically the, the president and CEO of the West Indian Company Limited is is hired and put on a contract. Um, and that contract by, by, the board. by the board of directors, yes. So I still have time left on my contract. I, I look forward to working with a new board because um, the West Indian Company is owned 100% by the Public Finance Authority right. and they have the opportunity to place new board members on the board. So we look forward to working with the new board as we look at advancing the cruise opportunity here in this district. Well, thank you for a few minutes of your time. Thank Appreciate you, it. thank you much. It's a man. pleasure, man. Nice talking with you. Yes, and I'm sincere. All the best to you. Share that since you are comfortable? Okay. <laughs> well, we've been here since 9 o'clock. <laughs> uh. So, G, that was interesting that he was saying, uh, I'm glad you asked a long way question. It's yeah. one that has been out there for quite a while. And uh, I think people really need to get an answer to that as to what was happening there and why it was happening. Uh, so, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because it was very interesting. Yes, thank you. Welcome, thank welcome. You afternoon it's afternoon yet not Just, yet no, not, not yet, quite not afternoon yet, not, not yet. quite yet so i want to welcome our next guest which is senator senator carlton Carlton Dow, former, Do. former and executive director of port authority, of port authority. So that was a good transition yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, one good, good, good morning to everyone you know, <laughs> and uh, again i want to publicly offer my condolences to say i thank you what i know you lost your mom recently so yes thank you con congratulations i mean well Condolences. My condolences to um, Senator Ford. So, Senator, um, again, I, we've been asking everybody this question. Uh, bittersweet, seeing the ceremony, did it, did it bring back memories? Um, you've been doing <laughs> this a certainly, couple certainly, times. I mean, it it, you know. it brought back good memories for me. We had, we had, we had a blast. Um, I was in a majority with a crew, I, uh, you know, Senator White, the Board Brian, the um, Alicia Chucky Hansen, Rocky Labor, Doc School. So, um, we'll see, I mean, then at some point we'll see Richard. So I really enjoyed what we did because we were able to, um, we came in at a time when we were able to try to help this territory. Uh, people had not gotten a few raises when we came in here over 10 years. We were able to do that. We, uh, working with a group of folks, we created um, legislation in which all the primary sponsors did the, uh, un the Supreme Court at the Virgin Islands, oh, which was huge. That's a, that's a big huge. one. That's a big That's a big So I enjoy it and I'm looking at these folks and um, what, as I look at them go, go by today, I'm saying, to, saying it within the celebration, the party, that's done after today. The work now really starts. Really starts. And we're and, now getting to a situation where this economic situation is dire. I am, I, I've been in the business, nobody needs to tell me that um, the biggest challenge they're going to face right now is a general fund that depleted. And I know, I, know, I know you have been active on the campaign trail as it relates to Democrats and so forth. Are we going to be seeing you playing any critical role in this new administration? Well, I don't know. I'm prepared to serve the territory in any capacity that they ask me to. I know, um, regardless of we, how we twist it to turn it, I am someone who go work hard and I get a job done. So if the administration believes that I can do something that, um, that they want, I'll be sure. I'll, 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 this is home. I will play a role. I, you mentioned the uh, general fund and its its rapid depletion. In general. What kind of ideas? Um, we, we just had Senator Nelson, who you know was a champion of the cannabis legislation, and and rightfully so because it is a multi-billion-dollar industry. And I, I think that's it's it's good that we we transcended, able to put our petty differences aside and move on to get something important like that on the books as a revenue, as a new industry, so to speak. Um, if you had to give this new crop of senators any ideas what, what kind of direction would you push them hey the quickest thing that i see would bring revenue to this territory is going after more rum production and the, the, we don't need to spend time arguing about whether it's going to be in st croix in thomas and st john to me we're in a difficult situation and the reason why that's the most immediate thing you have rum being produced throughout the world and in the caribbean we can work deals out where have the production. Diageo is not at its full capacity. And not, even close. not even close. Not even close. So they have capacity for more pr production. So whether the rum is going to be produced in St. Thomas, in Johnson Croix, it don't matter. 
and that's the quickest I would see uh, money is coming into the Treasury. The rum revenues have been growing in the last couple of weeks and, uh, and months and years, and so that's what, to me, would be the quickest thing. So the, the differences as to where it's going to go, that's, to me, that's minor. We've now got to move and move quickly. The rest of the world isn't waiting for us. Our rum job. production is, to me, the quickest set of revenues uh, I, I believe we can generate. And we've kind of got a little corner on that market already, so I, I think if we follow your suggestion and go the rest of the way, I think that it would be a, a solution that is, is workable and, and pliable uh, extremely, extremely rapidly. De de definitely, and um, truthfully, I've been trying to throwing a pitch out there to anybody that will listen, but I believe that knowing what's happening in the Caribbean, we're not concerned about what they're going to make, we're concerned about having it produced in the Virgin Islands, because that's where we make our money. And um, that's what, you know, the irony of some of this, people talk about Diageo when it was good or bad. This is one center we voted for Diageo. I looked at it as we, the government of the Virgin Islands, was facing that economic down downturn when Diageo came. And the government was able to borrow more than $400 million before Diageo produced one gallon of rum. They, and when you hear of all these projects, even the free tuition, and um, projects going on in St. Croix, Paulie Joseph Stadium. You know what? Is Diageo money spending? I'm, I'm glad to hear you Is say Diageo that. Is Diageo money spending? You sound like you're still in the Senate. I want to thank you for coming <laughs> us today. You're still selling well, in the Senate. I, I want to make sure, listen, man, I just pray for the territory and um, all the senators that have been elected. It's a heavy lift. I know they can do it. They need to work together, put the little differences aside, and do what's in the best interest of the territory. But my eyes are on the general fund. It's basically empty and that's where they're going to have to start. We'll keep a look. I just wanted to push one more time that the 14th annual Taste of Two Islands will be held on January 17, 2019. There are a limited number of tickets. Get yours now at the following ticket outlets. The Reuse Emporium, Chelsea's Drug Store in, in Red Hook, Fortress Storage, Urban Thread, West Bay Supermarket, or you can go online at WTJX.org. The answer to the sounds of cool session while tasting bite-sized taps of the, of, of the foods. Sample some of the whites from around the world. Delicious food from some of the best chefs in St. Thomas and St. John. The, t the taste will be held at the MCM Center on Antilles campus on Thursday, January 17th from 6 to 10. The shuttle will be running from Haven site to MCM Center at 6 p.m. and for more information, call 340-690 7293. We also wanted to make sure that we <coughs> notify federal employees affected by the shutdown of the, of the federal government will get in free by presenting their current federal employee photo ID at the door. So we encourage all to come out, go to the Taste of St. Croix, um, let WTGX, it's one of their big fundraisers, and we need to support them because they do a great job. And I want to welcome my next guest. Senator Roosevelt David, uh, real, real starlight of the party. <laughs> Welcome for being here. Glad to see you. Hey, see you in a It's my pleasure. Field. Good morning. It's Good really morning. a pleasure. You know, I'm very excited here today. And Why so? I, as I walked in here and I looked around, I started counting former senators. It's and I've seen a, a large contingent of them. We had over 16 former senators, so we could have had a caucus here today. Whoa. <laughs> and what that tells me is that former senators who have contributed want to continue to contribute, to look at the younger Good senators point. and help them moving forward. And so they are not feel as if they are alone. There are those of us here who are certainly capable, able to help them. All they have to do is to reach out. And I don't think they're going to be afraid of reaching out because I worked with a number of them um, during the campaign and some of whom were very successful. And so I'm pleased that I'm here and I believe I could still make a contribution and certainly we'll, we'll be doing that. But in addition to that, we have a delegate to Congress who is on top of a game. Oh, and yeah. this is oh, yeah. you know, a real Democrat. And then we have the Democratic team in the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Albert Bryan and Tregenza Roach who are so very focused moving forward with all the energies in the world and the support that uh, they really need. And the Democratic Party has worked hard to help them to get in. And I want people to know that the Democratic Party has always had an agenda. It's an economic 
agenda. It's an educational agenda. It's a health agenda. It's always there. From time to time, it's modified. And if they follow that script, there is no way that this territory could fail. It cannot fail. This not, it's not an option. We're going to move forward. You are a Democrat to the full. I am. I am. You know, <laughs> when I give bone. you my word, when I give you my word, it's my bond. Well, I will go up that, with you and I will go down with you. Besides that, besides not, your nothing word. Else. He's always said that too. Absolutely. I always have that. But yes, I, I want to congratulate you because you've, you've stuck to the script. I stuck to the script. You've stuck to the script. From the minute I've ever, you've always stuck to the script. The minute you've entered politics. <laughs> Absolutely. You've, you've been a starlight. And, and I'm glad to hear you say because part of it is that a lot of times as a former supervisor, you know, we elect people and then we let them go. Yes. We get them in office. And then we don't bring them any new ideas. We That's don't bring right. them anything to work Can't with. Can't do that. You have to shepherd them for the two years to help them, to Absolutely. give them ideas, your consideration. I don't care how small the suggestion is. It might be the one thing that can loom into something yeah. really, really big. So I'm really glad to hear you say that you're still here for them to reach out to. And Absolutely. Get Absolutely. But you're here too, John. You know, you've always been a man out there. You have a lot of knowledge, a lot of intelligence, and you've worked constructively during the years I've known you where you work at the um, election system and I always call you and say listen John you're doing a great job because it was coming from my heart you well, stuck yeah, to the yeah, script we need that, yes. you need that encouragement like Absolutely. you said stick yeah. to the script stick, stick to, to the script and I have my, my buddy here my friend here um, Gene Ford you know just lost his mother uh, sympathy once again thank you and um, he's not there now with the, the seat, with the vote, but he's, already but he's got to be helping. He's, he's got to be helping as well. He said you know? it on the air today. He's committed. Absolutely. And, he's yeah. and, and he's fresh. And so he has ideas. Some he left back there. He could just translate tra translate them over to the, the others. Let them just pick up from where he left off and move forward. You, you don't I, have to reinvent the wheel at all. I, I wish we had five more of you, but uh, yeah. unfortunately, it's only one who's been there. Only so, one who's been there. So, but so, we, but we'll, he's been we'll, touching we'll, lives. We'll, we'll make do with you. Absolutely. We'll make do with you. you know, <laughs> and I'm going to continue using my radio program to bring information to the public and to be objective and, and constructive and to help this community move forward. That's all we need. We don't need all this negative energy. energy it doesn't no. do us any good at all. There are going to be disagreements. And, and there should be disagreements because that be is what a democracy Absolutely. and a democracy at the end of the day, form of government, a deliberative the, at the end of, of the day, a solution is arrived at and it's a work of the solution. That's what you want. And that is the way it's supposed to work. In any deliberative organization, you have to have discourse. Yes. That's when you, you don't disagree with everybody about every, everything. We yeah, disagree right. on something. But at the end of the day is like you said, the solution. Absolutely. But finally, I just really wanted to say I support what former Senator Carlton Dow said about the rum revenues because that's significant. You think, you think that's important as well? Oh, critically important. It has, And he mentioned it very clearly because the revenue stream of Diageo is so strong that the government of the Virgin Islands was able to borrow off almost a half a billion dollars when a bottle of rum was not yet produced so that this government could have been saved. Otherwise, we would have collapsed. We would have collapsed, but there was no way to turn. When you lose $300 million in tax revenues in one fiscal year, where do you turn? You I'm send on 2,000 people, 3,000 people, it doesn't help because you still have to pay the bill. I have no idea, but I'm glad you came up for giving us some of your time. <laughs> All right. Um, you still sound like you're in Senate, just like the rest of that. We might have to have a reunion for you guys. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> but I want to thank My pleasure, David. Good, I want to yeah. thank you publicly also too for your support, for your ideas that you lend to us. Um, I know you have reached out to a number of us as senators and for your activity and involvement in the community. Thank you for caring. It's my pleasure. All right. Good. right. So, um, again, we want to pitch the taste of St. Croix. We want to make sure, again, that we get the word out that uh, federal employees that are affected by the shutdown, they are entitled to come to the activity free as long as you bring your employee ID and present it at the door. It'll be on the 17th of January at the MCM Center at uh, Antilles. We want everybody to go out and support WTJX on this endeavor. Most definitely. And I want to let the people know that they're watching WTJX TV, Channel 12, transmitting live from Charles Tamale, um, Virgin Islands. Translator ID WQ5AWD. I'd like to welcome our next guest, two time Senate President, uh, Armando Rocky Hardback. <laughs> right, you bud. Um, Glad to see you here. I haven't seen you for. No, I saw you during the Christmas. So yeah, yeah. I catch you during the Christmas. So. First of all, let me say um, <laughs> good afternoon. Well, good morning to you all and and um, to all your listening audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me extend condolences sure, to man. my Thank good colleague, Gene um, Ford, 
And I hope that this so, year be a good day. So, Rocky, watch this swearing in ceremony. I'm asking everybody this question. Did you get deja vu? Um, did you tear up a bit? Did it bring back memories for you? Uh, what did you feel well, when you I were watching did. this new group? Well, you know, it's, it's a, a sign of optimism. I, I look so at it you as you feel a, optimistic? Yeah. Because why, see, why? Tell me why. Let me tell you why. Whenever there's new faces, everybody comes with a big heart, want to do good things. Sometimes it doesn't always work that way, but at least you, you, you come you start with that. Here. You, 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 you have to have a vision. Okay. You have to have a, a purpose in mind, and we all come in with good hearts. And that's why I feel about it. That's how I look at it. Okay, you know? so as, as somebody that has not been in any of the major political parties, <laughs> You know, you know I couldn't let that yeah, yeah, sure. You know I couldn't let that say. <laughs> all, anyway, right, all right, Not have many any of the major political parties, but yeah. one that has crossed the aisle several times yes. and gotten a lot of work done as Senate president, worked with the various administrations. If you had to give some advice to the new group and the new governor? leadership of the governor and okay. of the executive branch, what would you be telling them now? How, how can they get together? Man, I got it right. The first thing is for the governor. The governor, he needs to find a, a way to fix all our roles. You see, we, we gotta make people feel a little bit happy about government. There's too much uh, pessimism surrounding government and function of government. So if he puts on his agenda, the first thing is to fix our main thoroughfare, and some of the ones that are traverse, you know, a whole lot, people are gonna see that at least we're trying to do something. Now how is he gonna get it done? I believe he needs to go back to Arclight and do a renegotiation go back and get this um, plant, the, the asphalt plant, get one for St. Croix and one for St. Thomas, St. John, because that's the <coughs> only way I believe it's going to work. You know, we got to be able to fix our places on the spot. And if you go to the States and you travel a lot, you see on the highways, they have a thing called heavy transit right in this lane. Right. And there's a reason for that, because the roads are not quite the same, but down here we don't have that. So we have to rebuild our roads using that concept. Somebody got to go study that and find a, a medium so that we could build all our roads like that, and it would be fine. So you're, you're talking about us doing overall infrastructure development. You're saying if the people see that happening, it that begins that will... to bring back some hope. And, and so you're saying to me that our electorate needs hope in order to um, feel that the government no, is functional? No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm saying just to you, asking the question. No, but I'm saying to you that our okay. people need to see and feel that there is something happening that benefits them in some way or form. Okay, gotcha. And okay. that's gotcha. what I'm saying. People driving too much a pothole, much on the cars. <laughs> no, no, they, they don't want that. If they see we're making an effort to do that and we're doing well, then they start to see other things are going to come into picture. So we you're saying it. go after the low-hanging fruits that affect individuals Something directly. you could do easy. Why? Because there's money for it. That's why. And, and there is money for roads. We know that right. we have That's Garvey right. funds that are out there That's that right. are already available. I think, Gene, you can speak to that as well, to the Garvey funds. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, so well, yeah. well let, let, me, let me ask you, though. You made mention about going back to Arcolite um, to borrow money. No, no, I, not to borrow. No, no. Well, to well, get an asphalt. Renegotiate. No, oh, renegotiate okay. to try to get an asphalt plant. Okay. And, and I think that we, we, we need to have public works doing a little more work. You know, when public works is available to take care of roads and it's for the moment, things happen. We can't be depending on two companies alone and, you know, no. We, government must be a service-oriented business. Not well, one of the things we realized during the hurricanes is that public works, as you just used as an example, they no longer have a team right. doing these yeah, things. These staff. things are contracted out. Yeah, right. So are you saying we perhaps need to move away from that Some of the contract, contractual? Yes. Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Because you know why? Because they are at your disposal at any moment. What about waste management? Well, I mean the same principle involved. You know, because I could take example of my home and say, John, listen, waste management handle that with two or three trucks. You know, they don't take no rocket science to handle that. Of course. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. But what, what about the barging portion? After you have a job, you got a budget. We had some free barges around here. We had some free barges. You could go to the federal <laughs> government, get some barge, get a barge run. Come on, listen, now is the time for us to try to bring it. The government ain't got the money. We, 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 we run in on thin skin. You don't mind all the federal talk. <laughs> the federal talk means that you have to invest your money for us. You, you know, if yeah. you don't have any money to do the work to get a um, reimburse, 
how it's going to happen. And, and I want you to emphasize that a little bit because I think that a lot of individuals don't understand that what we have before us is actually a reimbursement right. plan. It's really you spend you and you spend, get reimbursed. Yes. Yeah, spend, but I, I, spend appropriately I, and you again, get reimbursed. Again, I don't think the average person cares about the issue of reimbursement. They no. want, they elect you and you and want the delivery of service. Right. However, where I do part from a lot of thinkers is a lot of them think that everything in government is to be free. Right. And well, everything in government isn't to be free. True. Because you talked about waste management. Yeah. The very legislature and Gene, you were part of it, and I ain't gonna let you off the hook either. <laughs> <laughs> tipping the um, the tipping fees. The fees yeah. were to take effective a year ago. Yeah. You guys voted to stop it. Why? Let's, let's get there because the that's, that's the, money. The timing. Yeah, you, have, you have to look at the timing. You got to look at the burden that you're putting on the same very people that that's you're right. trying to serve and protect. You know, um, you know, your time is timing is, is key. I, I guess timing that's why key. I've never been elected to our team center. No, because your time wasn't right. <laughs> the, the other issue I was going to say is, so what about the idea of, of putting the tipping fees on the front end instead of the back end? So let's not pay for garbage getting thrown away. You let's pay what? for what he's brought in. So that's going to take up all my time here. So okay, let me, so yo, let me you get my time here, man. You'll, you'll be here forever when they talk about that day. Man yeah. think he's the president of the legislature, yeah. president of this panel, man. No. But you know what you're talking about money is? Gene was there. I, I gave him my idea 20 years ago. Bottle water and sell it. Yes. And I'm telling you. Still you still with that? You still yeah. with bottle water and sell it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 I co sponsor that today. as well. I, yeah, I, I believe was, in that. I believe the more in that, you see today, oh, yeah. every activity, every function, every uh, hurricane, tornado, the first thing they ask for is water. water. Right? Yes, that's correct. And if we are good at, do, we, we have a whole lot of water here. We got some of the best water. And it doesn't take much to do. Make WAPA do something. If WAPA was to invest in that, send them away, and it can still do it. As a matter of fact, I talked to Senator elect um, Gregory. I think she's. She's trying to look, to look at it. That's something we can create an uh, industry for us. Okay, and we haven't so done it. So let's, we, we let's got, do that with minimum amount of money. We got two industries so far in our discussions today. We got the cannabis and uh, cannabis I'm going to help you push water. the water industry. Definitely. I'm going to help you push that. No, really. I want to thank you for giving us some of your time, <laughs> Rocky. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to see you. Well, listen. Two term listen. president. <laughs> listen, um, I, it's always a pleasure to be here among good friends. You know, and I look forward to seeing you on another exciting episode. Thanks Thank you very much, yeah, and good luck to the people of Virgin Islands in 2019. Thanks a lot, Rocky. Rocky's a pleasure. Yes, Thanks, man. So, Gene, now that Rocky's gone, we, we and you can have the discussion <laughs> about that. Uh, okay, I, you, the tipping fee issue is important for me because I thought that it, it, it's important for us to, to make people change their paradigm and their thinking. In that, everybody thinks, when I was a child, People used to contribute. They would sweep in front their own store. Yes. We had recycling yes. program. We used to recycle aluminum, paper bag, can, all kinds of stuff. So we had a different issue. Well, of course, you know, um, one of the things that I believe that that's very important and we ought to um, try to reestablish is gaining a sense of pride. Our people must have pride in themselves. They must have pride in, in their home. And I think right there alone, that will help. Like I said, we have been doing things in one way for so long now that it's very difficult to introduce a new concept. And anytime you're going to talk about introducing fees, which individuals are going to see it as a burden for, for upon them, you have to be very strategic and the timing has got to be right. So, it, so you're it's saying not, that... It's not that the concept is bad. It's not that that is not going to be the, the inevitable. Uh, I believe that I do agree with you, I'm in full support of it, that I think that one of these days we are going to have to do that. You know, it's no different than, than if you look at even parking. Exactly. We okay. want to be able to park right and in front of our <laughs> homes. We want to be able to park right in front of the store for which we are going to patronize. And we don't want to pay. Exactly. And the moment that we, we implement meters, and we have talked about meters for a long while, it's very, very difficult for us to paint that big picture. And the question is, does the Senate have the ability um, to... You know, to that, you know that's where I was going. So I, I, exactly. You, you, and, 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 that, and that's the that. question. I, I, to be honest, I am not quite sure, um, not in the format or the structure in which we have. You know, we, we wanted to address this as an example. I co-sponsored a bill with Senator Francis as well to bring back civics in schools. In schools. 
because we got to be I, able. I, I thought that was one of the greatest yeah, yeah, bills yeah. I've heard of in the yeah. last ten years. We, we got to be able to get our youngsters involved. We got to be able to get them, yes, to understand what takes place, what the extents of the powers of the senators are, what the extent of the powers uh, of the the, the um, governor and so forth. We we got to be able to push them and again let them know how they can help. And I believe that you know. So so what was the fate of that bill? Well, I, that passed. Okay, that passed. passed. So okay. Again, uh, has it been instituted? <laughs> that's the big question. Well, you know, the, the in, and again, that's some of the things that we need to start to talk about. And I, I think in future discussion, we need to talk about implementation and enforcement because the legislature, and I got to be honest, they do a number of bills each year. And if you ever go back and, and do some assessment, um, you see that they cover a lot of issues. Now, does the executive implement them? question goes to how do we hold everybody's foot to the fire? How do we make That's these things the big get question. Up? That's the big question. You know, unless it is something that affects you directly and which is the pocket, <laughs> unless it is something that either if I'm going to give you an increase in salary, everyone is happy, you say thank you and you smile for the moment. If I'm going to tax you, um, everyone gets upset and it's like, hey, wait a minute here now, you're in a good, you're not working on my behalf. And so, you know, I, people don't pay attention unless it directly affects, affects them. them. And, and, and that, that's a point that I'm trying to make here. That you, it has to be, we, we have to find some means, some way to, to enlighten individuals. And I, I, I try to stay away from the word educate, because for some reason the word educate and education just seems connotation. a negative connotation, connotation, connotation you know. Yeah. And so I'm not implying that anybody is dumb or anybody, you know, don't know what they want or anything like that. But I'm saying that to see the big picture, I believe that a certain amount of enlightenment is absolutely necessary. Um, and, and how do we get that message across? That is what I'm not sure. That will, that remains a challenge. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just glad that we're having this discussion because um, in the next few minutes, the legislature will be convening uh, actually in, in the halls and making the new organization uh, for the leadership of the of the entity. And again, we have to be able to assist them. And I, I've, I've been driving this theme all day. That you can't let them go. You, you've got to, you know, you look at some of the numbers. We have um, Ms. Barnes getting over 6,000 votes in St. Croix. Um, Senator Gregory getting over 6,000 votes here in St. Thomas, yeah. St. John. The, the issue is we've got we to nurture them. We've got to help them along the way because I think individual ideas can assist us in addressing some of our outstanding problems. And, and John, I, let me just interject here because I, I know that you said something earlier regarding senators thinking that they know it and all of that. I can tell you... Divine however, intervention, that's what I said. Yeah, but, uh, but, I, <laughs> but I want you to know though I believe that senators appreciate when individuals reach out to them. Good. I can tell you there were many individuals that reached out to me, um, you know, expressed a certain angle, a certain aspect of, a, of an issue that, you know, I was not thinking of. And, and, and I was grateful for that. If nothing else, even if they didn't change my mind it's in, in its entirety, what, what, it, what it did though, it helped me to see the bigger picture. Broad, the broader it, sense it, the of broader the issue. The broader side of the issue, yes. And, and it helped me to bring amendments forth, you know, um, to strengthen whatever the, and, the and issue that, is. That's, that's critical that you said that, about amending that. Nothing has to be perfect. You don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater because you're not going to get it right every time, every time. on the first Absolutely go. Absolutely not. So being able to amend the law to, um, to tweak it so more or less to make it more beneficial to the community at large, I think is a great thing that's able to do. Um, recently, I did some training for the legislature for the new incoming senators in the area of parliamentary procedure. And that's one of the things I really stress to them, that you're not always going to get it right on the first, the first strike. strike. You're, no, you're not. Absolutely and not. The, the process lends to modification. Of course. And, and I'm, I'm glad that we're able to do that. Other issue I wanted to address really quickly was with the reestablishment of the new legislature, what happens to the central staff? That's a question someone asked me. I, I told them usually central staff, from my knowledge, we have a certain number of individuals that are vested in terms of time. If you've spent 10 years or ten more, years. I think the number is 10. T 10 years you're, you're, you're vested. So if you're under 10 and on central staff, what's your fate? I, I don't think the, the, the approach, at least in my June, my tenure, the approach has not been to terminate or to um, uh, get rid of anyone from central staff. Central staff tends to be uh, protected somewhat. 
Um, of course, the senators, the new senators, will bring along their staff, the and individual, the, and their individual, individual staff. staff. And even some of the incumbent senators may have a change of staff within their personnel. In fact, the, the common thread has been that individuals from, the, from senator's staff tend to fill other positions on central staff. So there's, there's always a gravitation towards central staff. Generally, they're protected. Of course, there are a couple positions that are answerable directly to the, um, to the president, president, and such as the chief of legal counsel, okay. such as even the executive director. Uh, um, even though we really have not business? seen the, the, the executive director of business. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one yes, of the issues, yes. I, the way you ask that question, because a lot of people are concerned about, as you know, we have a new administration on, the, on, on government house, and you usually have a wholesale firing of individuals. And someone had asked me the question that if I had the opportunity for us to discuss it on the ear, what happens in the legislature? As, and as I told them, central staff usually sticks around for a long time because oh, the yes. institutional knowledge has to stay around to assist. And in this case, a very large set of new incumbents that are, are taking up their seats. Oh, yes. Once, once they do, and, and they're the ones there, you're going to find that senators have to rely heavily on central staff. Central staff plays a very critical role. They're very valuable. And, and you know, the, the, there's nothing to be taken lightly and for you to just arbitrarily get rid of them. Absolutely not. You know, it's funny because we've been here quite a while now. And to look around now, the uh, Emancipation Garden has everything looks a little sparse. Everything is, everyone is making their way, I guess, over to the Senate. Um, it's been quite a pleasure to sit here and converse, but more importantly, to see how our electorate um, actually comes and participates. Uh, and that was, you know, usually when I'm here, I'm either traditionally I was on the stage uh, doing the reading in the certification of the Senate. So this is and one of the first times I've really gotten a chance to, to sit down to, in the yeah, and, and watch and observe the, the you activity. Know, and we didn't get a chance to point out, we pointed it out off air that the Seven Day Adventist um, school was here. had uh, Pref their brought children, brought the children here right. to participate. I think that is good. That's and, the you know, kind of civics and, you're talking about. That's the kind of civics that I'm talking about. Not only that, uh, you know, I thought originally when I first saw them, I thought they were part of the program. I did too. But obviously they, they weren't they part were here of the to program. Observe. They were they here to observe. observe. And, and that is the interest I want to garner. I mean, I know that in my office I had some interns that will come in after school again just to sit around, just to, to see what and, and participate to learn the process. whatever level they can. And that is so very important. And the legislature, of, of course, as you know, we have You have your pages, pages right? The pages yeah. that every, they still participate. Every session, you have the pages. Now, 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 quickly, just for the edification of the public, how are they selected? How do you select pages? Um, the, the pages are selected with the president's office. To be honest, I have never been um, involved in selecting the pages. I think it's but just it's through the office of the president. Through the office of the president, uh, they make um, um, contact with the school, and they normally ask for a senior student, someone who might be going along. The, to the best of my knowledge, going along a political science area path. Uh, has some some interest in that path. You know, that's that's funny because a lot of times when we, we talk about civics and, and students, um, and and I this this phrase that just killed me. Oh, the children are the, the future, the youth are the future. But a lot of times we really don't get them involved as we should. Um, Recently, when they had the uh, inauguration for the governor, I saw that he had a number of schools participate. And I just think we need to put a greater emphasis. Again, this paradigm's changing. Um, I think I became very active in politics because of my civic training, because yeah. of my volunteerism, because of Boy Scouts and those kind of things that make you actively part of your community. And I think we need to do a better job of getting um, your wife and I are very good friends, and she's done a lot of work when she was working down to, I guess it was Gladys Abraham when, when I was there. Gladys it's, Abraham, it's yes. still Gladys Abraham. It's still Gladys Abraham. And she was doing well, a lot of different things down there. Programs that would get people actively involved to be part of the community. I think we need to move back in that direction so that we can actively have um, a, a more communal sense of the Virgin Islands. I think National it's important. Pride, I call it. You see, education is not just about the academics. You know, education is also about living, survival skills, and not just merely survival skills, but a quality of lifestyle. How do you address um, issues within our community? Um, you know, how, how do you 
lifestyle. You know, lifestyle. 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 You know. So I, I think that that is where we want, and that's the level. And you know, to give a Senator uh, Nelson spent 14 years, he has contributed much. Immensely. I, I am glad to hear him say that he just doesn't want to be known as the, the cannabis uh, uh, senator. senator. You know, and, and you know, I thought that that was so very interesting because when, and, and the popular thing is when you mention his name, that's the first thing you're going to know him for. But he's much more than that. And I got to give him credit also to, he established the Youth Council. We established, right. And, and, we established the Youth Council. The right. Youth Council. Youth Council in the, le yeah, in the legislature. And, and, and so that's one of the things that he has done a very good job with, and that's one of the things that I had pledged that had I been re-elected to, that I would have continued uh, um, as well, because I think that it is so very important. Glad to hear that. Now, moving on to a real issue that is a pers very personal to me, is the re issue of the upcoming March 30th, 2019 election for about the initiative on reapportionment. You are one of the individuals that voted to have the March 30th election. Yes. I don't want you to explain I, your vote, but tell me why you thought it was good to send that to the people. Well, I thought that it was an initiative of the people, and so therefore we should and, Which see, it was, which it was, it was of the and, people. And so therefore we should see uh, um, what the people carried to the, the larger population of the people. Um, you know, I, 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 I am not an advocate for it. I wanted to get a voice from the people. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, I didn't want to say, I'm glad that you said you're not an advocate for it. I'm glad to hear you say that it's like making a motion and somebody, although you may not be in favor of the motion, you second it so it could come to the floor. That's, that's the only method that brings that, business that, before that's how the organization. Exactly. So to hear you say that, saying, although I'm not a, merely a proponent of it, I wanted it to go to the people so that it, it's in front of the populace. I think it's important to remember that while we might be opinionated and while we have our own opinion and our own justifications, we're here also to, to represent individuals. We're representing people. And so the voice of the people have to be heard. And this is one way in which you get the voice of the people to be heard. You know, again, I believe that a um, tremendous amount of education um, was, is necessary. Um, so with that said, do you think that can be done between, between now and the 30th of March? Well, it didn't just start now. It started from before when we voted. It started from the issue and the initiative first took place. So we, we're not going to measure the timeline from now. But we have to measure the timeline from all from when the efforts first began, and I think that again, you know, um, tremendous efforts have been taking place in terms of trying to enlighten individuals. And if people are truly interested, if people truly want this, they certainly have enough time. You know, we find time for everything else. We got to find time, you know, to to express ourselves to our elected officials in terms of what our destiny will be. You know, uh, I, I'm gonna take a minute though and use my own. Um learned training, uh, talk a little about what reapportionment really is. And by, by all theoretical knowledge, uh, by paper knowledge, reapportionment is supposed to take place by three methodologies. It's either based on population, a census, mm -hmm. a, or after a census. You can have it by court order, or you can have it by gerrymandering, where the legislature redraws the lines of the various quarters of of the, of the island. But reapportionment really is basically where you have, you realign the number of senators that are going to serve. That is why I have a problem with the, the, def, the definition and the, the title they use of reapportionment. What we're trying to do here based on the initiative that I read was change the number of senators that presently exist and how they are elected. So it's more a system of representation. Well, it's, more, it's, more, it's more so how they're elected rather because I think the number, re no, no, I'm sorry. The number, the number is going to remain the it same. Remain, remain the same, yes. So it's really just a system of representation change, meaning that we would go from so many, so many being on the district level to so more many, so many at being at the at large level. Um, as an elector, I feel that I'm losing something when this happens. I, and I certainly think so. And not only that, I think uh, if we look at what takes place right now, we elect one individual for the Senate at large. And we recognize also the, 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 the amount of resources it takes for that individual to put out. 
And I'm not quite sure that our community... No, no, repeat what you just said. I think that's critically important because you have run a district campaign. So repeat what you just said. I would really like our listening public to hear what you just said one oh, more time. Yeah. The resources. The resources. I mean, it's endless amount of resources for an individual. I mean, let's face it. To get from here to St. Croix. It's $300. $300. Plus you got to get a hotel. And you got to get a car. You need a car. <laughs> you can't walk. So the point is the cost will exponentially increase. Increase. And, and we're moving to go to, I think it was about six or seven at large senators. We will come, have not have seven anymore in St. Croix. We're going to have in the Virgin Islands. We're going to have, I think it's uh, three or four. Three, I think it's three. And, three at the district. And, and then the, 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 the district balance, level. The balance at, at, at large. large. Yes. And, and so that, that issue is exponentially for the candidates just for the candidate is going to increase campaigning tenfold. Yeah, and, and then there lies the problem. Of course, um, remember also too that it's a temporary position. Correct. You know, um, you know, one has to be wise to know how much you're going to invest in a temporary position that's not even guaranteed. Correct. You know, every two uh, years and, and you're, up, you're, up, you're up for, for re-election. I mean, can you sustain that? Can, can our business community even sustain that? You know, and, and we see also, and I can tell you, having just gone through a gubernatorial year, you know, it is not very easy for senators to gain support, financial support, from the business community during a gubernatorial year. The attraction is always to the gubernatorial candidates, and so senators really suffer greatly during a gubernatorial year. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's a really good point. It's, it's critically important because in a gubernatorial year, the chances of, of senators getting money from businesses diminish twice as much oh, yes. because oh, they, yeah. ha they have other major interests. But we oh, did yes. want to remind our viewing audience that uh, we are waiting for the uh, members of the 33rd legislature to convene in the legislative um, halls, um, Robbie Atley halls. Uh, once that has been done, we will be switching over here from Emancipation Garden directly to the Senate Chambers where they'll be able to go on and watch the viewing and organization of the 33rd Legislature take place today on the 14th of January as the law has provided for in the Revised Organic Act. Um, in, in addition to the reapportionment issue, and I wanted to just come back to that quickly, I think the educational process really needs to take place because I don't think the average citizen really understands how they will be affected. Right now, it's our present system. I have seven senators from the District of St. Croix. I could go to the supermarket at any day at any time and run into any one of them and you know this better than I do because when you were in the Senate, I'm sure you couldn't go any place where somebody wouldn't say to you, Senator Ford, can I speak to you for a minute? Because it's truly a 24-7 job. Well, I always tell my wife <laughs> that a five-minute walk takes me no minimum of 20 minutes. So that, don't ever expect, you know, <laughs> you, you, and, and you know how well... You can't run to the shop. You can't say, well, it's only five minutes away. What took you so long? You can't run to the shop. You know, <laughs> and then you can't, you know, and our, our populace, they take offense to it if you're in a hurry. Of they course. They offensive if you don't say stuff. Of course. They just want you to say hi. They just want you to say how you're doing. They want you to show that you care. So it, it, it's, it is, in fact, 24-7. It is, in fact, 24-7 because, and, and as having been former supervisor, I would experience pretty much the same thing. But when I worked at the legislature as a chief of staff for a few senators, so one day we got in the car, we were going for a drive, and it took us like two hours to get from, at the time we were at contentment, uh, next to Golden Cow, and it took us two hours to get from there to Fredericksburg, yep. which he had said to me, isn't unusual. And that's why I was saying, there is no easy way about this. And that's why I feel like I'm losing something, because when you become an at-large senator, and by the way, this is just my personal opinion. If we were to go to a two-tier government, meaning that right now we have a unicameral legislature, single house, one house alone. We're not changing any of that. No. We're not changing the number of senators. If we were to go to a bicameral house where we had a house and a Senate, and a Senate. I could better understand and feel more adequate that something was done, being done in my favor. But by not changing the structure of the legislature, but the way people are elected, 
I think we're doing ourselves a somewhat of a disservice you know, because we're getting the same product. I often tell individuals, look at it as if you're buying a piece of the lottery. And what are your chances if you have one piece of ticket or if you have seven pieces of the ticket? We so pick that. We pick that. What are lottery. your chances greater? Which, wait, which, which way are your chances are greater? With one piece or with seven the pieces? pieces? And, and so that, that's the, the point is, is the more you can vote for, is the more empowered you are. The more individuals that you can have a voice and say, I am selecting this individual because they represent my views. I, I think that they can do a good job to represent me. I, I, you know, I think that that's, that empowers people. Because that's what that's where the people get the power. They get the power from the from vote. The that's that's the only method that's, that they have. That's the where only they get power they have is the have vote. Is and so you don't take that away. And if I go to one individual and they're not responsive, I got seven others, six others that, in, that in the I district plus, to a, at, I, plus a, at large and that I can last. go to. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing that is stopping me from even going to another district. Nothing at all. There's nothing at all. Because you vote on all items, whether all you're items in this you're district or the island senator. senator. Right. So you're voting You happen to be everything. elected in your district. In the district. But you vote territory-wide. Territory-wide. So my question is, do you think the initiative... I, and by the way, I do want to make... Before I go there, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Before I go there, though, I do want to congratulate the proponents of the initiative activity. Almost um, definitely. Having been the former supervisor and watched many entities come before me to try and bring initiative onto the ballot and get defeated without being able to get the signatures, I want to applaud them for their success Almost definitely. in bringing this to full fruition for the first time in our history that it can be and shall be on a ballot issue. No, no doubt about it, the work has been done. They, they uh, did the, put in the legwork. The passion is there. The persistence is there. I mean, I, 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 I joked uh, with um, um, one of the proponents, uh, Mary Moorhead, and told her just about every place, because it was during campaign time, just about every place I went to, she, she was, was there. there. And I, I, I told her and all that I, would, I needed to put her on contract at least to, <laughs> to <laughs> campaign for me, because she was there, she put it out. And, and, and regardless to, to what one's position is, you know, I, I think that we have to show respect for other people's belief. And, and they believe in this sufficiently and, and they expressed it and they put out the work the physical work in terms of moving around the island, in terms of asking individuals for their vote and Ghana in the actual, um, well, we, you know, we, of course we, we, we signed we, some cases, she took some we, abuse, we, we, we saw that on the legislature. We want to end on a positive note, we want to uh, thank her for doing that. We want to thank definitely. you for watching WTJX live coverage of the swearing in of the 33rd legislature. We'll now go to the legislature where they will be commencing their first session to conduct the organization of the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands. Have a great day to everyone. I remember the taste of two islands this Thursday at the MCM Center and on Tilly's campus, 6 to 10. Get out there, support WTJX. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate your time and effort.